welcome everybody. We do have a tight agenda, so I'm going to try to get us moving here. Um, this evening is brought to you by the Rec Shelter Team. If you are on the Rec Shelter Team, please raise your hand. We want to thank the Rec Shelter Team as well as Bethany Church for lending their space to us this evening. Um, also, the Rec Shelter Team, One Main and Cockadoodle Pizza for helping us bring food to you tonight. And thank you all for coming out. Um, this is a really important topic that you obviously acknowledge because you're here tonight. So we don't have a lot of time for introductions. There's a lot of us in this room. I'm ex really excited to see the turnout this evening. Um, instead, I'm going to jump into instructions. If you'd like to introduce yourselves to the folks at your table, I would really encourage that. And then you have half an hour to eat and go through our first exercise. Our agenda tonight is starting with a personal exercise to help walk us through what would you as an individual do if you were homeless tomorrow? What would that look like for you? Then we're going to hear from some folks in our community that are providing services to folks that are unhoused. We're going to hear from them what the experiences are, what the gaps they identify are. And then we're going to come back together and have some brainstorming around what were the gaps that you identified in this exercise? What were the resources you identified? And are there some things that we could bring um, to fruition within our community to leverage and add more supports for the folks in our community that are unhoused? Before we jump in, can I see a show of hands if you know someone who is or has been homeless or at risk of homelessness. There's a lot of us in that room. All right. Um, on your table, you're going to see a couple of things. You're going to see the agenda, but the agenda behind that also has your worksheet. The risk of homelessness is closer than we think. There are so many scenarios in our lives that could end with any of us becoming homeless. Some of those might be a household member who passes away, a household member who loses employment, a divorce, unexpected medical expenses, a rental building that is sold and tenants must leave, when a landlord increases the rent and the household is unable to pay the difference, a household that sells their home because it's a good housing market to sell in, but they're not able to find another house to live in. A household relocated for work prior to obtaining housing. Domestic violence. A household that experiences a disaster like flood or fire. Or a building that's in disrepa disrepair and no longer habitable. We see this on a daily basis. The exercise we want you to look at today is how would you find your way back to housing stability if one of these circumstances or the myriad others affected you and you were homeless tomorrow. We do know that in the current housing market, what we're hearing from providers, that they are seeing an average length of homelessness that can range from 12 to 24 months to move from homelessness to housing stability. So keep that in mind as you're doing your exercise. You're probably not going to resolve your situation tomorrow. So what are you going to do in the meantime? Then we want to have you work through a few questions. The first is, how would you meet your basic needs if you were homeless? For example, how would you access shelter, food and water, bathroom facilities, laundry, electricity to charge important devices, mail, your medical needs, transportation, etc.? Do you have pets? If you do, how are you going to care for them? Then we'd like you to look at what resources do you personally have access to that could support you? What resources in your community can you rely on to support you? And to help with that, we have a handy dandy packet of information of resource sheets on your table. We'll go over that in a second. And then, what resources do you wish your community would provide to help support you if you found yourself in the circumstance? And lastly, how would you get from homelessness to being stably housed, and how long do you think that would take? <clears throat> also on your table, resource packets. There are um, sheets on shelter, which are the blue, the Good Samaritan Haven, Upper Valley Haven, Charlie's Loft and St. John's, 
The Economic Services Division, Emergency Housing, so this would be the hotel stays that folks have heard about. Local camping options. The local housing market. When I did a search on Friday for housing in the Randolph area, this is what I found. Craigslist to the Herald and a place called housingdata.org. So take a look at those, see what's available. And now, enjoy your meal, work on your personal journey out of homelessness, and we'll come back together at six, I think. So we are going to invite some folks up now to share their experiences um, serving folks in our community that are unhoused or at risk of homelessness. Um, first, actually, we have someone to share their personal experience. So Casey, do you want to come up and introduce Michaela? I would love to. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm Casey Reibold. I work at Capstone as the housing counselor here in our office, and I get to meet lots and lots of people. And one of the, the latest people that I've been working with for the last uh, two months, maybe, is Michaela. She's here in town, and she's experiencing homelessness. And we're coming up with some creative ways to to find her place to live. You Come need on. to put the microphone closer to you. Not everybody's going to be this short. If I move it, it's going to it's never going to go back. Can you all hear me? OK, good. Because I can get really loud. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Michaela. Um, I don't want to cry. But I became homeless um, after I found my brother. He died of a drug overdose. I'm sorry. You got it? I'm right here. Um, my brother was my best friend. We lived together for a while. Um, I tried to help him through his drug addiction, <laughs> and I did a lot for him. Um, I lived in a trailer that was owned by my mother, and I um, tried to do the best I could with rent and everything else, with all the mental stuff that I was going through, <laughs> because I have borderline personality. Um, I have complex PTSD, um, which was diagnosed after I found my brother. Um, I've been working with different places in the community to try to help me get back on my feet. Um, I chose not to go to uh, a shelter because I have two dogs um, and I absolutely love them. I don't know what I would do without them. Um, when I'm sad or upset, they're right up against me, just trying to make me feel better. Um, I got kicked out uh, almost a year ago by my, by my mom. She handed me an eviction and told me to get out. After I left, I went to I kind of like slept in my car for a while um, with my two dogs. Um, now I am, I have family members that are around this area that have stepped up to try to help me and help me find a place to live and have been like washing my clothes and letting me take showers, um, eating at their house, um, stuff like that. Um, a couple months ago, I got into a car accident and lost my car. Um, I almost died in that car accident. Um, luckily, I did not. I made it through. Um, and now I'm just, I'm working with Claire Martin, um, Capstone. Um, I'm going back to school uh, to try to get my high, high school diploma. Um, I just want it to be known that homelessness is a huge serious problem in the community and every community around this area i've noticed um that it's been difficult for people to get into places some places are way too expensive they're way overpriced and um 
with the emotional stuff that I've been going through, um, I, I, I needed to take a break from working and try to focus on my mental health with how bad that it's gotten. And I know that it's gotten pretty bad. So uh, I just wanted to tell you guys my story and how far I've come since everything has happened to me. But I, um, I just hope that we can help each other out and make this a lot easier for people that are not necessarily in the same position that I'm in, but with everybody who has different, different things going on in their lives so that, you know, this kind of stuff happens where they lose their housing because of it. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, I would like to inv uh, invite Scott Kluart with the Randolph uh, Police Department. Good evening, guys. How are you tonight? Yeah. <laughs> all right, I love the top notch. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. I wander, so I, I don't like being. Okay, how about now? <laughs> Oh, you're killing me, killing me, killing me. Uh, so I've been in this community since uh, when I first came down and I started with the Randolph Police Department way back in the day. It was around uh, 2009. And I've been in and out uh, with the uh, Randolph Police Department, uh, the Orange County Sheriff's Office, and now again with the Randolph Police Department. Um, and I will be honest with you, I have noticed a huge spike in regards to uh, homelessness in this community alone, but I have also noticed a huge spike of homelessness in general in every community, not just Randolph. Um, way back in the day, to compared to what we do now, um, there was really no resources for anybody way back uh, in like the 2009 era. Um, now, you know, there's a lot more that we can help refer to. Um, you know, and like piggybacking on Michaela, um, you know, times are tough and it's not just this community, it's uh, statewide, it's uh, nationwide. Um, what kind of questions do you guys have for me? I, I could probably talk here, but what kind of questions do you guys have for the Randolph Police Department and how we deal with anything uh, regarding the homelessness or all the above? What, how, what are you guys looking for? Kim, please. So how do you address um, the random tents in random locations around town? So it, it all depends on where the tents are located. If they're on private property and have permission to be there, um, it's not a problem until it's a problem. So we're kind of just kind of letting them be in and you know trying to get their feet back underneath them. Um, like the area down by the bowling alley off of Prince Street. Um, that is a privately owned area. It's not town property. Um, so they have permission to be there until they're asked to uh, please re relocate to somewhere else. So we're, we've been kind of like hands off. If you get calls for service or anything like that down there for whatever myriad of reasons, you know, that might uh, force their hand to do something different. But um, as of right now, it's private property. And as, the park and ride is, you know, a state-owned, uh, you know, area. Um, the state's been pretty hands-off because they're also recognizing the uh, shortage of homeless uh, or uh, homes to rent or all the above. As Michaela said, they are expensive, and not everyone can afford, you know, twelve hundred, two thousand dollars a month for rent with nothing included. Um, so they, it used to be only a couple of days that you're allowed to camp there, but they've really kind of uh, overlooked and allowed people to kind of be there until it becomes a problem, and then the state will come in and kind of push them along for whatever reasons, trash, uh, disorderly conduct area, you know, type uh, behaviors, drunkenness, uh, or anything of that nature, then it kind of gets pushed out to another location, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am. 
suppose you come upon uh, someone living in their car mm -hmm. that um, just are traveling through, but they park in a parking lot, like down the street from uh, behind the bagel shop sure. down there. And it's a family mm -hmm. with children, which I know can happen. What resource would you refer them to? So Casey's my uh, go-to. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, those are the resources that, you know, are really within this area that we can try to reach out and, you know, try to get any kind of services that they may require. Um, homelessness is not illegal in Vermont. So uh, there is people that uh, would like life choices and that's just the way they are. But with those kind of family members, um, with, especially with small, small children, what kind of resources can we help them navigate to try to make different choices? Does it answer your question? So you go to Casey. Yep. Yep. <laughs> She's my go-to. <laughs> Martha. So what kinds of, <clears throat> you say you're seeing it spike all over the place. What measures are you using? and? I'm somebody that's done some things like five years ago, building units and 10 units I've helped build, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But um, at that time, there wasn't much interest in trying to do things here. Mm -hmm. and, and there were questions about how much need there was. So I'm turning to you and asking, what ways have you seen the need being accelerating? And um, <clears throat> there could be perhaps a need for the kinds of units that I was working on before. So where I need to be next is a select board meeting uh, where they're actually having these conversations about uh, lower income housing uh, unit, brand new units being built here in town. Um, so those are parts and pieces that are in play. They just haven't been finalized as of yet. Um, back then to where we currently are is a constant burden of housing. You know, uh, there's not a lot of apartments here to rent in town and what is available are really, really, really expensive. Um, for people that are low income or no income at all, they can't afford that. Um, so they're trying to rebuild or build uh, you know, more of the lower income housing. We're just not at that final stage as of yet. So let me comment a little bit. There was a group, um, actually, <clears throat> Linda was the one that initially pointed me to in, in that direction indirectly through Ramsey um, that has in Oregon um, community assisted uh, community supported shelters and they ended up their problem is much larger than what we have mm -hmm. <clears throat> but they ended up with three different blocks in the, within the city <coughs> that they had one for vets one for mental disabilities and one for those that were that tended to be in the the drug rehab kind of arena, and um, they they developed them. They brought in the community services to be able to address their specific needs to those different scenarios, and then was working. We're working. They had a goal of everybody's out of here within a year, getting the kind of training that they need to be able to be self-sustaining and supportive supporting themselves in other settings. Um, uh, that doesn't begin to look like something that immediately fits the Randolph area. We're, we're not there yet, uh, especially in this community. Um, like in your greater Burlington area, there may be something a little bit more, but I can't speak to Burlington because I'm not in that community. Um, we're not there yet. <clears throat> um, that kind of a setting could really use like a lot that was dedicated to allowing that these units they, they could be built for like two thousand dollars now mm -hmm. i don't know what they look like you know that was five years ago i don't know what the construction prices look like today for that but i'm just um say relatively cheaply and with community assistance could be done within a week's time easily mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and as I said, I mean, we're, they're building, uh, or they're projected to build um, a set of uh, low-income housing uh, out on Salisbury Square, uh, but 
the ones that you're talking about, we're just not there yet. We're just not there yet. I mean, basically, these are something that's a lot better than a tent. <coughs> Yep. In winter conditions, they sure. had four-inch thick insulated sidewalls, and they, I, I, the fellow that I worked with, he was able to heat his unit for under 50 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. Yep, I hear you. Yes, ma'am. So I, I just want to call attention to him. I think there's one more question. So I wanted to ask about the... No, please, go ahead. Uh, I'm listening, uh, I, I, but I am recognizing it. The <laughs> overlap between crime and homelessness. See that there's a correlation there? Yes, but it's not for, you know, you're, you're classifying homelessness and then you're also classifying crime. Sometimes they intermix, but not all the time. You know, um, for somebody that uh, has been sleeping in the park and ride for a month, we could have no calls for service. Another individual that could be in the same circumstances, we could call there every night. So there's no cookie cutter solution at all to say homelessness is causing crime or all the above. We're, we're not seeing it in this community. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. What, what kind of crimes are you seeing in the homeless community? So we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, drug abuse, uh, intoxication, uh, disorder, uh, disorderly conduct, um, but that's that's the the bulk of it right now. Yep. Okay. A lot of narcotic use, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'd like to invite Michael Redmond from the Upper Valley Haven to join us, please. Hi, everyone. Hey, Jenny, how are you? Good seeing you. My neighbor at St. Paul's Church, uh, one of the founding churches of the Upper Valley Haven uh, almost 45 years ago. Um, it's, you know, maybe that origin story is important uh, as I think about it being in this church basement. It was probably something much like that 40, um, 43 years ago when um, people that were worshiping at St. Paul's came together and were concerned about the uh, homelessness in the community. And uh, you know, this is long before there was state funding or uh, much going on, uh, nothing in, in the area uh, of Hartford, where White River Junction is where, where we're located. And um, it was from that uh, that then expanded to five other, four other churches and members you know, from there, from Woodstock and Lebanon and, and White River Junction, that the origins of uh, uh, a charity that uh, today is is quite you know substantial in, in considering its origins, um, uh, bought, they, at that time, they had a benefactor and they bought an old house and um, full of feral cats that they <laughs> removed and, um, and did the repairs to, to make it habitable, but at a really basic level, and then ran with volunteers. And uh, the first people that stayed there this is, uh, were a couple whose last name was Bishop, and so well, why not, right? Uh, um, and but from that, um, over time, they realized that um, it was more that needed to be done. Sometimes beyond the capacity of volunteers, and is there then a, a path that you know forward, which ultimately led to an organization that has now 60 staff and a budget of about you know four about five million dollars and and um, has um, two shelters currently, one for adults, uh, 20 beds, and another for families, eight families, and we're about to, and those are not drop-in shelters, they are where you come in and you stay until you can, we can help you find housing. Um, but we're about to embark on a building project, uh, we're still in the fundraising phase, but we have permission from the town to add a 20-bed drop-in shelter, so a uh, low barrier and welcoming everyone. Um, and, uh, and we'll see how, you know, that goes. And then, but with a, the not only shelter beds, it's, it's helping, what's the next step? And that's what we already do in our, there's a whole separate program of community outreach that um, we're in the woods uh, where people are working with our police department in Hartford. Um, 
trying to help people stay alive and, and you know, the, the walk-in services every day of showers and food uh, that we can help sustain them. But now, in a new building, we'll have a, a whole floor that'll be dedicated to where people can be during the day uh, as well, uh, which we don't currently have. And uh, it won't draw everybody in, but it will draw some in. And uh, speak of earlier, uh, it will include pets. Uh, I haven't thought about two dogs yet, but, there's, but there will probably be people with two dogs and, uh, and cats. And we're already doing that in our other shelters, as we're calling them emotional support, uh, you know, just to put a label on it, because they certainly do that. And uh, that's all, it's going pretty well. Uh, and um, so, I don't know, you know so I, I talk with Linda all the time. We're part of the same in our region of the state. Vermont divides up the state into some number of regions. And the North Windsor, Orange County, uh, Upper Valley is, is us. And so Linda is a big help to me as, as her role in chairing a coalition of organizations, uh, which includes uh, uh, organizations like Clara Martin uh, for mental health and HCRS, which also provides mental health down in the southern part of the in a district, and um, many others uh, I met tonight from not your the domestic violence organization, uh, um, Safeline, and uh, we work with WISE, which has a very similar program. So it's a, you know, the stories are complex, um, the, um, uh, and find this, and we have, we're fortunate that in this community, there are a lot of people that want to make change, that want to support change, We're recognizing that's hard. You pointed out uh, some of the places where the work and the life intersects with people who maybe not, not completely understanding what's happening or who are just you know, really close. And there, as the uh, police officer said earlier, there can be what we'll call externalities of life outside. It's dangerous for everyone who's living outside, but sometimes because of addiction histories and use and untreated mental health and untreated physical health and um, personal interactions built over a lifetime which they don't like each other and uh, there's um, it could be uh, challenging and, and uh, looking at Jenny again we know that that in the church vestibule there are people sleeping and we get calls and what do we do when they're outside and um, it's you know tough you know moving along is not a good idea, a good strategy um, but not criminalizing homelessness, which was the tact that the police here take, and, and they do as well in Hartford. We're fortunate, I think, both communities to have uh, police departments that get it, you know, understand what's happening. Sometimes they have to enforce laws, which does make people move along, um, but it's not their preference. Their preference is to work with the community. And as what we like to say, it's not Capstone's problem, it's not Safe Line's problem, it's not, it's a community reality. And the best, in the best communities, and I think it sounds like it here, and we're trying to build that as well in, in Hartford, is where a community comes together and says, we want it, we need to do something. And our approach, we want it to be non criminalizing, it's to be supportive. And then it's getting resources. We may be more fortunate in some ways, and Upper Valley having access to a bit more, um, but it doesn't, we didn't, 45 years ago, we didn't have all that. Uh, so, you know, I'm always willing and uh, to work uh, to help uh, with our knowledge of the work that we've done to help anyone who's trying to bring something along. And that's, you know, so my role tonight is to learn a little bit more about uh, what's happening here and to see if there's ways that the Haven can be helpful to you in, in your undertaking. So happy to answer any questions, but that's, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, tonight. Thank you. Question for the mic. Yes. <clears throat> what number of people from um, Orange County do you end up seeing at the Haven? You know, that's a, you know as I look at the, that's uh, not as many as in, in the total gathering. So there's, you know, if you looked at, as my, my memory was that in the point in time homeless count, in um, our district, there was um, there's probably 150 who were counted 
in uh, in our area, a much smaller number in Orange. But I think we still, the, you know, driving up, I'm thinking this is a solid half, 35 minutes, you know, going 70 miles an hour. It's a distance, and people are where they are. They want to stay where they are. It's there are some as just as we get folks from New Hampshire just across the river, but we're more likely to get someone from New Hampshire than we are from Orange County. Yes. How do you finance it? You said that you have a budget. Like, yeah. Is it um, grants and subsidies, or is it through the listen through shop? Or? Yeah. No, we're. Um, uh, it, it, we do for our shelters. We we do a lot of things at the Haven, large food programs too. But for our shelters, um, we get some grant, significant grant funding from the state. Um, there's a, through the Department Office of Economic Opportunity in the Agency for Human Services, part of the D Department for Children and Families. You know, if you work your way through that. Um, there are they have uh, in this area. They provide grants for providing shelter, and there's now a time when there's actually some expansion money available. The, the state has looked at this and said, we need to do more, and they put more money into that. Um, and then for operating funds, they will give you money for us you know, to have shelter staff and to have a service coordinator, case manager, and a little bit of overhead. But then we have to raise money, um, probably get Maybe 60% of our funds come from the state, and then 40% we raise through charity. This is where I think our location is a little more advantageous than yours, because there's a mix, greater mix of people with more capacity, as well as those without the same folks that are sleeping in your outside as sleeping on our outside. But they're surrounded by these other wealthier communities that look in and say, want to do something, and they help the Haven, and they help other charities. So we're fortunate in that way. Coming on your facilities, how many beds do you have? How did COVID affect it? Oh, yeah. We have uh, 20 beds in our adult uh, facility and eight families, uh, eight space for eight families in our family shelter. And each, there's four, uh, can have four bunk beds and, and they can put cribs in so we can have lots of, you know, in those private rooms and then communal kitchens and then. Um, but and then we'll then we'll have twenty. We're at twenty beds of a drop-in shelter is our next move. And and are they able to stay there twenty-four-seven or? Yeah, the the two shelters that um, that we operate, it's not a drop-in model. You there's a process you go through which the state requires called coordinated entry and it ranks people by need and so that's how we then. But we have some opportunity to select who comes in. I have to obey a few rules that we have. Uh, we're not dry, but we're not, you know, low barrier, somewhere in the middle. Uh, and um, uh, so that's, I forgot what the second part of the question was. Uh, uh, yeah. I was asking how Oh, no, stay out the state. Yes, yeah, so they get to stay. So this is, they are, once you're in, you're in. And so the average, I think we I get some data sheets that were included, and it says, I think, 200 and, 175 days, I think, for the family shelter, and 225 days average for the adult shelter. It's just, and that's when I arrived six years ago. It was a, probably a third of that. You know, it's um, it's really because of the same tough rental market, mm -hmm. people not enough uh, income. Uh, and, and you have showers too, right? Yes, yeah, and then we do showers for walk-in um, as well. We do 12 showers a day for people living outside. Uh, and during COVID, we went to half capacity just to uh, spread people out more. So it was one person to a bedroom rather than two. But that's when the state put up the big motel program. And we had 60, oh, no, 100, 120 people in motels. And that was a huge challenge. I know there's a lot of people that have to and talk. We're back to being full. We're back to being a full capacity. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's, so, Michael, yeah. is. Are you going to be here for a little yeah. bit longer? Yeah, I can say as long as you want. Um, and also, there is a resource sheet on the back of your um, worksheet that has websites that you may want to check out. And there is a resource sheet for um, the Upper Valley Haven on your table. All right, next I would like to invite Linda Runyon and Kim McCurley to come and talk about what we have done locally in terms of shelter options. Kristen Chandler. OK, Kristen Chandler <laughs> and Linda Runyon. Do you want to go first? 
Sure. Bethany comes before St. John's. Forget it. B becomes before oh, B. All right. Yes. We'll do it alphabetically. Hello, hello. I'm Kristen Chandler. I'm a community member, and I am one of three managers of Charlie's Loft, which is right next door. Um, it's a one-bedroom apartment that Charlie McMeekin uh, saw a need for for emergency shelter here in Randolph um, a couple of years ago. And since he passed away, uh, it's taken three of us to take over his job. Um, and I was just over there today painting, and I managed to remember to change my shirt, but not my painting pants, so apologize, apologies. Um, we take uh, uh, families, um, we take pets. Um, it's an it's a idea behind um, Charlie's Loft is it's a short-term emergency stay. So um, what that looks like for different people will depend, but we hope that it will be no more than three weeks. Um, I noticed on the handout that it says you can call the number, which is our uh, Charlie's Loft um, cell number, which we pass among the three of us who are managing it. Uh, that's not quite accurate. We, we, we take people who have been vetted through um, Safeline, Capstone, Gifford, Claire Martin Center, and the police department. We, we've tried to educate um, some of those local resources in town so they know um, what our capacity is. Um, not, none of the three of us are experts in um, you know, risk management or evaluating people. So we rely on our community partners to do that and, and to they know the kinds of people who we can um, take there. It's uh, changing a little bit because there's a child care center going in on the first floor. Um, that's going to be opening in September. And so we're working on our rules around that about who might be eligible um, to be upstairs from that and have the potential of interacting with small children. Um, it's not. Um, uh, we don't, like, while the th whoever's on call that week among the three of us, we will check in with the person, see what they need and things, but we're not their case manager. We're not um, going to be, you know, checking to see if they're drinking or using or whatever. Um, so we really rely on those community partners to um, send us folks who we can manage on our own. Um, I think that's it. I just did, I just want to say, Michaela, thank you very much for your courage in, in telling us your story. It takes a lot of bravery. Nicely done. Linda. Well, I'm Linda Runyon from St. John's. Some of you may know me as the director of the White River Valley Chamber of Commerce as well. But um, I am the, the main contact for the shelter space at St. John's. Historically, Father Tim Everhart opened St. John's um, many, many years ago. and We were the only bed in town at that point. Um, so we had a couple of cots and we just use the back corner of our parish hall. It's nothing fancy. It's not the Ritz, but it's safe and it's warm and it's dry and there's a bathroom and people have access to the kitchen. So we do have food there for people who come to stay. Ideally, it's for one to two nights for one to two people at a time. And um, it's, it's a little difficult because on Tuesdays and Thursdays we do have a meeting at the parish hall so people can't come till 8 o'clock. So that's, that's kind of a detrimental thing. But um, we get referred to uh, references by Capstone and also the police department, Clara Martin, and Safeline. So it's basically the same sort of setup as, as Bethany, but we're shorter term. Do your people have to get out in the they do. They yeah. can't stay all day yeah. um, because of the use of the parish hall. That's the but that's the big difference. But it's, you know, we're open and we're happy to provide a bed and what people need for the night or two. Or some people have stayed as many as four nights. But so. That's year round? Yes. We did open up as an emergency warming shelter this winter. And, um, we didn't have a lot of people come. You know, the most we ever had were two people. Um, and I, we don't really know why. We don't know whether it's because word didn't get out or whether it was because it wasn't a constant thing. Um, we don't know. So we're going to be exploring that and maybe exploring maybe what we can do differently this coming winter. Questions? Any other questions? Kim? Are 
you guys going to do record checks, or how are you going to know around that issue of who can be above a daycare? Uh, we're relying on those community partners to have done that vetting part. Yes, we are not capable. We're not. We don't. We, we're not doing record checks. We are. We do a basic intake. Um, you know, name, date of birth. I think we take their driver's license if they have one. Um, but n no, we are not doing that. What else? You want to talk about the capacity? How how often? Oh, Terry wants me to talk about the money, <laughs> the need for money. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the capacity, it's, um, you know, since uh, Deb and uh, Martha and myself took it over, we've had one, we had one guest who stayed, we, and we actually had to, um, we didn't evict her, but we had to give that person a deadline to move out. And she had two small children. And, I, and just as a note, I think people, just so you're aware, and looking at the resources you have, you know, the... Um, the housing that the state provides, the motel vouchers, you get 80 days. And so when we spoke with this guest, she was very, very aware of that and was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to save my 80 days for winter. She said, yeah, I, I understand. I haven't found another place and I'm going to go camp because right now I can camp with my kids, but in the winter I'd much rather be in a motel. So that's the reality, I think, right, Michaela? For a lot of people, they have to really think about that uh, here in Vermont. It's an issue. Um, so our um, our hope, as I think I said that before, is, is is the maximum would be about three weeks. And by hopefully by that time, people had figured out uh, or gotten a housing voucher or been working with Casey or whoever and had been able to come up with something else. But I, I'm assuming from your exercise, you may have decided amongst yourselves that it could be kind of difficult if people don't have friends and family in the area. And we, um, you know, I, I, this community has really supported the loft uh, in incredible ways. We just put out a call for paint because we wanted to brighten it up a little bit. People have offered not only paint, but their accounts at Central Supplies, you know, for us to use for uh, things that we need. We have a ton of volunteers who are doing the laundry after every stay, you know, we're, we're doing the bedding people who are volunteering to wash windows and just clean up the place, do, clean it after each guest. Um, all, all, anything you can imagine. People have stalked me on the street and said, what, what can I do? And so we're really lucky in this community to have that space and the people here who are supporting it. Good? We good? Yep. Time. We got to keep it moving. <laughs> yeah. um, I think a valuable piece of information just slipped out there, though if we want to do anything, bodies are required. Right now we have a really small group of folks that are involved in this, and so if we do want to have more capacity in the winter with St. John's or any other program we do, we do need volunteers and help, so put that in the back of your minds. Um, I just realized uh, that I didn't introduce myself, so I am Linda Anderson, I am the Director of Family and Community Support Services with Capstone Community Action, and I chair the REC Shelter Team. All right, so next up we have Casey Reibolt with Capstone Community Action. <laughs> Me again, sorry. Uh, I wasn't really sure what I was going to say when I got to this point of the night, but Linda put together this great handout. And I, I'll start with, I've only been at Capstone for eight very long months. <laughs> and I've met a lot, a lot of people and a lot of you in this room. Um, under her little handout here, what would you do if you ended up homeless? I think I have seen an example of all of the reasons people come through to Capstone. Um, it, it's amazing what little insignificant or not insignificant event can spiral a person or a family into homelessness. The good news is a lot of people showed up to this meeting. <laughs> and so that's half the battle right there. We have to figure out how to work together to help solve this problem. We have to show a lot of compassion to people who are in these situations and we need to figure out how to raise some money <laughs> and where to put units to put people. I'll take any suggestions. 
<laughs> now or later. <laughs> um, I've been pretty lucky to get people housed fairly quickly. Um, but also, I have a lot of people that have been on my list since I came here, and I inherited them from previous housing counselors. Um, that's, that's tough. They don't always fit the mold for housing. They're not always disabled. They're not always elderly. They're not always a single family or a family of low income. I just took a call today from a woman who is very gainfully employed and we looked online to find housing in her area in South Royalton and we found one unit, a, a three bedroom home for $3,500 a month with nothing included. Nothing included. And they will be checking your income to make sure that you make three times that. Um, that's never going to get rented, <laughs> ever, ever, probably in those standards. So we need to find affordable units. RACDC is uh, building lots of units. I think it's pretty significant. I don't think they're here tonight, but um, I'm told Heading Drive is gonna double, Salisbury is going to double. Uh, we're looking at like almost 40 units, I believe, in Randolph, which is great. Um, but a lot of people still won't fit the mold to, to fill them. They'll need to be um, families or elderly or fit the, the economic uh, piece of that um, and be considered low income. Um, and unfortunately, some of the places that might not fit those, those people are being filled with travel nurses uh, that are coming from out of town, um, that are not nurses that are coming from our community or our schools here, um, which means they'll also have to travel somewhere and go somewhere else. Um, we're not keeping them here. Um, and and the problem just keeps getting bigger and bigger. One of the, the crimes that Chief Kluat did not include was was smaller crimes, things like retail theft, which I'm hearing is on the rise because I, I have taken phone calls where store owners are very upset that uh, candy bars and sodas and sandwiches are, are coming up missing and they know that I'm working with the homeless people who are taking these items, um, yet we're not necessarily finding ways for that to happen and I didn't realize um, the food shelf is a fantastic resource in this community and we need more things that are readily available for someone who's homeless it's great for people that have um, a kitchen to cook things in or a refrigerator to keep things in but it's hard to keep a head of lettuce in a backpack not impossible but difficult um, so i think we just need to get creative and and figure out how to solve some of the other problems that are surrounded by homelessness I don't know. What do you got? What, what do you mean by food that's readily available? Um, yeah. Sandwiches. Not sure. Tuna fish. Non they can do some wrapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens when you get a can of soup at the food shelf? I, I'm sure it's great cold, but maybe not in February. Uh, and I'm going to. And if it's not a pop top. Yeah. If it's not a pop top, it ha you have to have a can opener. Um, you know, there are, there are some barriers there for food, too. Um, I, again, not disparaging the food shelf. We're very fortunate to have the food shelf. And Veggie Van Gogh, I literally send everyone there. Uh, and I pretty much send everyone to Clara Martin as well. <laughs> everyone to Clara Martin. Everyone to the food shelf. Those are great resources. Um, I don't want them to go away. I want them to expand. <laughs> Casey, speaking of that, are you it for housing coordinator for Capstone? Is it just you? Or the Randolph? Just area. in Randolph, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have Marilyn Cook in Bradford. And, and we have whole teams in Barry. Yeah, Barry, Barry and Morrisville have uh, five people probably each. Yeah. Yeah. How many people are you looking for homes for right now? Currently? Roughly speaking. How many on your list? 75. <laughs> And this is summer. This is summer. 
Yes. That nope. And that is just for Randolph, or is that more than Randolph? I mean, Orange County, Orange County, and some of Bethel, Windsor County, like some of Bethel, South Royalton. Orange, Northern Windsor, probably. Yeah. There's also but, a lot of people that aren't on our list. Sure, there's lots of people that don't come here. There's lots of people that are in the tents by the bowling alley that have never come in to see me. I've gone to see them. They've never come in to see me. So you, you said there's a need for fundraising. Can you comment on what those goals are? I mean, fundraising for a candy shack to be able to, you know. I, I mean. I think that depends on what we decide to do. Yeah. If we want to do something, if we want to stand up shelter, uh, if we want to expand the food shelf capacity, any of these things are going to take money. And unfortunately, things like shelter, we're not going to see state funding to support what we stand up here. We don't have the critical mass that they really need to be able to, sh to show that this is an area to invest in. So if we want to do something here, it's going to take creativ creativity. No, I reached out, is it Kevin there? Yeah, he's still there. Uh, yeah, I reached out to Kevin there not that long ago about uh, use of a bathroom or shower, um, thinking that, but it's not really available anymore. They have a, an apartment that's been rented, and then they have the restaurant there now, so. They have several apartments, though. They're, they've renovated the whole thing into apartments. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the oh, White River Craft, Craft Center. Center. Thank you. <laughs> um, the one other thing that's prohibitive that we found in exploring shelter needs is the cost of, of staffing. Mm -hmm. Staffing is sky high. Um, and you have to have some kind of infrastructure to run these programs. So mm -hmm. that's been one of the real stumbling blocks for trying to do something here. Um, I don't want to, this is a great conversation, but I do want to move on to our next person. Next, um, next we have. Uh, Randolph Area Food Shelf and Gifford. So Rachel and Lisa, you want to join us up here? And you can cover both yeah. at once. Both at once. Two for one. Okay. Is Julie coming at all? Hi everybody, my name is Rachel DiStefano. I volunteer at the Randolph Area Food Shelf. I'm on the board there, I'm also the volunteer coordinator and a bunch of other random little things. But I wanted to just talk a little bit about what the food shelf is. You know, we are co-located co next to Capstone, which is really great. Um, as Casey said, there are definitely some improvements that can be made in terms of types of food um, as we're trying to kind of evolve to the new population and just changes that we're seeing. Um, so we are open Monday through Friday for a couple of hours each day, and we really try to make it low barrier. We don't ask very many questions. Um, we do have to get people in our computer system, and so we do ask about address. But there's, um, that's really just to see what towns people are coming from. Um, and so I don't have hard numbers about how many people who are experiencing homelessness use the food shelf. Um, but anecdotally, we are hearing that about one to two individuals every day um, will come into the food shelf. And sometimes it's, they are kind of very open about their situation um, because they're looking for certain types of food. Um, but other times we may not even know. So. It's definitely more prevalent than it was a few years ago. Um, I asked our storefront coordinator who's volunteered for years there. Um, so that's again anecdotal, but um, seems like a pretty clear trend. And then when I asked her about the different foods that, um, that she's seeing be, we can offer, um, small cartons of shelf stable milk, cereal, bread, peanut butter, canned meat, tuna, chicken, um, definitely having the pull rings is important there. And I guess uh, the other thing she said is just easy to eat and keep foods like juice, bread, snacks of all kind. Um, some folks who are camping do have access to a grill and we do have frozen meat, so sometimes they will take frozen meat. Um, and I just wanted to also say that folks can shop once a week, but they can come in every day for food and for bread and produce. So once a week for like the shelf stable items, but bread and produce is every day. Um, so just making sure everyone knows that and is aware. 
and everyone's welcome. Thank you. Any questions for me? Yes. What items can you accept as donations from the community? What food items? Like garden stuff? We can accept garden stuff. We do not accept um, home processed, uh, like let's say applesauce or jams, um, because of the potential food safety issues there. Um, that's guidance from the Vermont Food Bank that we that follow. That is not guidance from the Vermont Food Bank. I'm sorry. Talk to John Sales. He will tell you okay. that is your local legal opinion. Okay. No, that's fine. There's. I think there's some gray area. I know there's been a lot of back and forth, but we welcome garden produce that's fresh and unprocessed, as well as all sorts of other foods. And we have a wish list on our website. Yes. Um, quick question. You said you welcome everybody. I know that in the past, you had to be from Randolph, Braintree, Brookfield, Granville, maybe once mm -hmm. a while. So when you say everybody, are you really meaning everybody? Yes. You don't have to have a electric bill or a piece right. of mail anymore? No. No, we do not have that anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want me to say it? You don't have to. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Delegato, and I've worked at Gifford for a long time. I know most everyone in this room. <clears throat> and yes, Casey is, and Linda, kudos to you two. You do a lot. Um, so at Gifford, I worked as a nurse for a long time, and then I moved into this um, grant-funded program called a Community Health Team. And what we're supposed to do is, is try to help people find resources to keep them healthy. Um, so one thing I learned quite quickly was that if you're couch surfing or have been told that you're going to get evicted, there's not, you're not homeless yet. So you don't qualify for homeless supports yet until you're, there's no time to you know prevent it. We just wait till it happens and then we help. That's kind of frustrating. Um, also, I work with a, some quite a few people with untreated mental illness that do realize that they have anger issues and that they can't live with other people. So they are choosing to stay in what used to be considered unsafe um, or not fit for human habitation, which are campers. So I have one gentleman that's lived in a camper for at least 17 years because he won't live consider anything other than me finding him a, a mobile home in the woods. <clears throat> and he, I think his disability is either 500 or $800 a month. I'm not sure which it is. So that that's kind of difficult. Um, I lost my train of thought there. But um, yeah, I just try to find people food or housing or what, whatever, whatever comes up. And yeah, that's it. A lot of times, there's sometimes where they have no income. Like I talked to somebody today that was in a tent, and she um, has she has no income, so she she doesn't even know where to start yet. She has already stayed at Bethany, <laughs> so she knows about that. Oh, the thing I was going to tell you was that the I think correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the state of Vermont decided that campers were okay to stay in, but they wouldn't help them heat them anymore. So that was one thing that I had to help him with because he was not happy about that. Um, yeah, so now that's okay to stay, but we're not going to help you heat it. That's a state library? No? Yeah. So what Lisa's referring to is the um, crisis fuel rules. Uh, crisis fuel, we had some flexibility for a long time, and then in the last few years, they've they've started to tighten things up so that they're now, um, your your building has to be, permanent. It has to be a permanent structure. So if you had a camper or a something that was a permanent structure, you might be able to get it. But if you have a camper that's on wheels and can be moved, it's not a permanent structure and you can't get crisis fuel benefits to heat it. Um, and what Lisa's referring to is during COVID, one of the ways that we tried to help those people was the state would actually pay for campers for people because it was a logical housing option. Um, but unfortunately, we paid for those but now the resources aren't there to help people heat them. Um, any other questions for Lisa? Otherwise, yeah? Um, how do people come to you? Through the ER or <coughs> you're associated with Gifford? Yes, um, uh, my grant is for people that get their primary care at Gifford. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much the only mm -hmm. rule, yeah. Do they, do they come through the ER too, Lisa? 
Um, people can self-refer. Uh, uh, anyone can call me out of the blue. Um, yeah, it, it's just any any way people come. So do you have to have a primary person? You are supposed to have primary care at Gifford, but wherever they go, there's usually um, a, a person like me in their health service area. And also, I sometimes do direct them to places that they, you know, could go. Thank you. Uh, we have two presenters left. I want to invite up Christy Everett with Clara Martin Center. Hi, everyone. Thanks for letting me join you tonight. Um, my name is Christy Everett. I'm the Director of Operations at the Clara Martin Center, which is the community mental health and substance use provider here in Randa. I think a lot of what I will say is just sort of um, vouching for everything everyone else has said about some of the challenges that we are seeing. You know, Clara Martin Center has uh, had the Safe Haven program in the Randolph area since the late 90s that provides uh, transitional housing for individuals 18 or older who can stay up to two years. You know, when I started 12 years ago, average length of stay was three months. Now people are right up to that 24 month period before we can find them housing. Um, we opened our 28 South Main Street program in 2019, which took a lot of community involvement to renovate that abandoned um, building and make it into four low income units, which has been full since we opened it with no transition of people moving out into other areas. So we've had those two uh, services. We have tried a lot to look at how we're providing services and make sure that if people need services, need uh, outpatient mental health or substance care, that there's no wait time for services. Um, I think Jenny can <laughs> vouch for some of the work that her and her team have done around that, that right now anyone can walk in and get an assessment for care and we can provide those services. Um, as Michael said, we're trying to do a lot with different community partners, working with the Hartford Police Department on um, working with an embedded substance use provider who works in the evenings and weekends, and one of our nurses to go out into local uh, homeless encampments and communities and try and provide services right on site there um, to get people to what that they need, to get them the support that they need. We have tried different things as well. Um, we have a building in Randolph that we have actually worked with an architect to put a plan together that would uh, offer a community kitchen, shower facilities, bathroom facilities, Wi-Fi access and everything else like that. But like everyone said, Funding is a huge issue. It's cost prohibitive for us to do that right now without some major fundraising, um, that which we don't have in the state right now, won't support idea for that. Um, but that would allow us to also provide that space for people in the community to meet some of their basic needs. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have that um, anyone who has experienced homelessness will find, if you don't have an address, to get mail to, it's really hard to, for people to hold on to the documentation that they need to make sure that their benefits stay in place. So a lot of times we'll have people come in and we need to work with them to make sure that we can get them even access to mail, track down documents for them that they are not holding on to. Um, so that is a barrier to making sure that people can get what they can get. Uh, we have a lot of folks who come in, you know, looking at how the support that Michaela has had from her animals, don't want to go to a shelter if they can't take their pets with them. And we know that is huge for folks to maintain their mental health stability and their sobriety is the supports that they need. Um, so I think we're trying to put case managers, more case managers on staff to do some outreach into the community, to work with local partners, to be at the tables where we can, to bring these, to play our part in these community collaborations, um, but without funding there, we're, we're tied in what we can do. Um, we are funded by the state, about 85% of our funding comes from the state. Um, and state legislator needs to approve that for us. So we've done a lot to try and look at outside federal grants, statewide grants to bring services there. Um, a lot of the programs though take a lot of time to develop. So I'm, I'm encouraged by the number of people in this room, the number of providers in this room, because these are conversations that are really important. And I think for Clara Martin, we want to sort of play whatever part we can in what the community of Randolph and the greater Orange County need um, that we can provide either through our sites or out in the community as well. Um, so I, I think if there, yeah. Uh, I can't answer that, <laughs> that one. I would turn it over to Linda. Yeah, so I think 
I think invitations went out to them. We left it up to the committee to try to expand, to send it out to everybody they had connections to. And so at least a few of them were invited. Our select board was as well, but unfortunately, they have a conflicting meeting tonight, so that didn't work out. Um, Martha, just real quick, what's your question? I, I wondered what any of the professionals in the room think of if we had COVID to do over again and didn't expend all the expenditure that we did on the, the, the hotel housing program and had that as a cash sum in hand, what kind of thing might you have done with it? I, you don't need to answer that now, but I'd, I'd love to have hear, hear your replies. <laughs> I think that's something we're going to have to think about and come back to after we get through this. Um, so I want to invite Linda Ingold from Safeline up, and then as soon as she's done, we're going to jump into some brainstorming based on your exercises. Hello, I'm Linda Ingold. I'm the director of Safeline. Safeline is domestic violence, sexual abuse, for Orange County and Windsor County and the northern tier towns. I don't have any shelter. I have nothing to offer to you in that because we are on the receiving end of needing housing. Um, we are open to any victim of domestic violence, sexual abuse. Mostly we work with women. Most of those women have children. When they call us, they need housing immediately. They need to get out. They need to get safe. So I'm here tonight to learn what sort of options there are. As you've heard, we use uh, and take advantage of many of the resources that are here. And we always need more resources so that we can do immediate housing for someone who, as we've said, has pets and they don't want to leave, they will stay in their abusive situation because they want to stay with their pets. They will leave with their children. However, we need to find housing that is uh, suitable for children too. Most of the women and children want to stay in this area. They go to school, they have a job, they have their doctors here. So it's, uh, I'm one of you in trying to find the solution to housing. And I'm going to be here if anyone has any questions about domestic violence, and I will let the rest of the program go forward. Thank you. All right. Let's get our thinking caps on pull out your notes, we're gonna do some brainstorming. Um, before we jump in, I just wanted to throw out there that a couple of um, gaps that we see in terms of folks that are homeless, uh, Christy alluded to one, mail is a big barrier. If you don't have, a, you can't get a mail, a PO box, generally, without a permanent address. Um, you could rely on general delivery, but it's up to the mail, the post office, if they'll do that. Um, so that's been one of the struggles that we've found. I think there are some workarounds, but they're not things that have been readily available in the past, but I think we're moving in the right direction there. Um, but if you don't have a mailing address, or if you don't have ID, it's really hard to get things like a job. It's really hard to get an apartment. And these are some of the barriers, some of the small barriers, like 15, 25, $30, which impact that huge basic need we all have. All right, so first up, we are going to ask the question, what are the gaps that you identified? When you did your exercise and you were thinking about, what would I do if I was homeless tomorrow? What gaps did you see? Raise your hand. Anybody? We're going to put them up here. Transportation. Transportation, okay. Anyone else? What gaps got in the way of moving from homelessness to stable housing? Jobs and childcare. What else? What would have gotten in the way of you moving from homelessness to stable housing? Pets. Pets? Okay, what else? Not asking for help. Not asking for help, thank you. Not having savings or money. Okay, not having money or savings, thank you. What else? What were other gaps that you identified that would have gotten in your way to making that transition. 
So um, not having family or friends that you could ask for help, um, access to bathrooms, facilities. Bathrooms, showers. If you haven't showered in five days, you're not gonna make a great impression when you go look at that apartment or go to try to get that job. You're not. Laundry. Access to laundry, access to a phone. What else, what other gaps did you identify? A place to put your belongings. A place to put your belongings. A lockable place, a lockable place definitely. Anything else? A place to stay in the daytime. A place to stay during the day. Yeah? Not asking for help, like like I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know not um, acknowledging that you have a problem. <laughs> you know, you're, you're homeless. Uh, you 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 don't have a job, um, and you there's no there's no one that uh, outside of you, like your family, for example, no one they can call to say, I know this person is in trouble. I know they're homeless. Uh, and, and as far as I know, there's no place you can call to say, can you go out and reach out? Yeah, so not acknowledging that you have an issue and not having access for your family members to get services involved. And that, that is very, um, that is an important thing to remember. Most of these services really do require engagement on the part of the individual. The individual has to want help. They have to be willing to engage in those services. Um, and if they're not, there's not much that we can do. Not knowing who to call or where to go. For not knowing where your resources are yeah. in your community. Yes? It might be less so seen, but uh, I know I'm in college, and if I suddenly lost my ability to have housing, I don't know what I would necessarily do, because I wouldn't want to cease my education necessarily, but I can't work full time mm. as well as uh, be successful in education. So being able to do both is really difficult. And I think bringing out resources that might assist with that, so struggle between being able to meet your educational needs to move you forward and be able to afford that apartment later on and trying to work to be able to do that. Um, I did see a hand over here, and then I'll go over here. Um, in thinking about the youth in the community, mm -hmm. in which they are just byproducts of so many things. So if you're, if you're 14, um, what becomes of you, and how do you even start that, that thinking? Because you're a byproduct of the, the family, you're a by, you, where do you, what do you do? So like generational poverty, maybe so, existing? And, and how we work with um, the byproducts. Mm -hmm. I, that's not a nice thing to call them, but they're young. Yeah, so we, um, there's an approach, of the two gen, two gen approach and community action, and that's really looking at that. How do you work with um, the family and the children to move people so that you're, you're not just working with kids, but you're working with their families as well and trying to model that. Uh, community action across the country is looking at that approach. Um, so it's definitely um, something that some organizations have uh, tried to implement, but it is that idea of um, you know, how do you work with youth and kids and the families as well. Um, over here. Um, so I think one of them would be finding those in particular resources. I, when I first became homeless, I think I called 211 a <coughs> hundred million times to try to get somebody to answer me or to help me in any way. And they're like, sorry, there's nothing. We don't have anything. This is dead winter. So like, sorry, I can't help you. We can't help you. You're gonna have to figure it out on your own. Like, I guess it's just finding like, like Capstone is wonderful. It's a wonderful place. I actually came here from Rutland because I looked everywhere in Rutland for places that would help. I tried Brock, they wouldn't help me. Um, and then I heard about Capstone. So that's why I took a leap of faith and came to Randolph to get the help that I needed from Capstone and just, um, decided to work with Clara Martin too um, for my mental health. That's great. So I think um, what Michaela is alluding to is there is definitely a lack of resources. 
And when there are resources, we are generally uh, overburdened. There are too many people that need our help, so we do end up having wait lists. We have people that um, we would love to be able to help, but unfortunately, we just don't have the staffing to be able to meet those needs. Uh, right here. Um, just in addition to phone access to technology, to Wi Fi, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. to adequate cellular service, which I can't get in Randolph, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> But you know, everything's online, application, yeah. everything is online. Um, if you don't have that or if you don't have the skills, mm -hmm. um, or, yeah, it's a real issue for them. Any other gaps? Uh, minimum wage doesn't, if you work a full time job, you still can't pay the current rents. At yeah. Minimum wage. So along with that cell phone, you also have to be able to charge it so you need access to electricity every once in a while. Yes. <coughs> but that is their lifeline. Food storage, kitchen, ability to Food storage, kitchen, ability to cook. <laughs> Glad to see you're not me. Um, all right, anything else? Okay, these are our gaps. Next, we're going to talk about what are some potential resource ideas that you came up with. What did you find that could help you, um, that could support you while you were on that journey out of homelessness? Or that could help you survive while you were homeless? I know for the um, young folks, for, again, on the education front, just as I know a little bit more about it, um, early college programs or flexible pathway programs through a lot of colleges allow um, students at high schools um, who are in their senior year um, to combine that with a freshman year of college. It is very simple to get in, and your tuition is paid for through the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. So making sure that that's a known program that is available to students um, because seniors can be like hitting over 18 and they might not have a stable house to be staying in mm -hmm. so being able to know that they can at least get education through that um, and I know dorms are very expensive but that a lot of colleges would offer assistance through that um, mm -hmm. and that is during the winter so that would definitely help mm -hmm. for at least the younger people there. Okay. So did everybody hear her? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what other resources did you come up with? I thought you came up with a resource, Linda, that I didn't think about. But it, this idea about having a, like a space where people could maybe have lockers and a kitchen, community kitchen. Oh, I think that was Christy was talking about that. Yep. Yes. Uh, and um, <coughs> charge their phone. And like, mm -hmm. if you had like a community. A drop-in center. That would be fabulous. Yeah, it would be fabulous. Yeah. Shower, yeah. yeah. And we could even bring services on site so yeah. people could see us there. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Let's do that. Grants. There are a lot of grants out, out there. Uh, sometimes they're hard to find. They, they're deceptive in their appearance, but they are there. If you have someone who knows how to write grants, and that is a skill. Uh, they can very well be utilized to bring in megabucks, actually. Absolutely. Uh, Lisa? Uh, one thing I try to help people with is getting some money. So if they uh, want to try to get a job, if they have a chronic medical condition, that there's hireability that I can refer them to. And sometimes I help people apply for disability, which is not a quick thing, but sometimes if they aren't going to be able to work. They need money to live on. So hireability is another community resource that's available to help folks with a disability um, get supports they need to obtain employment. Um, and Lisa, you also said, so it's hireability and uh, applying for disability, which there are some supports in the community for, but not, I think, as much as we see the need for. One other thing that we talked about in the police committee uh, like months ago was embedding a social worker with the police department mm -hmm. and a social worker who had skills they could do a, use, uh, have leave behind kits for mm -hmm. substance use mm -hmm. that would have a cell phone in it and uh, testing strips but also they could also do lots of other things um, 
And you know, the town agreed and put a line item in their budget for that. Um, so I'm hopeful that in the future we might have that resource right here in Randolph. So an embedded social worker with the police, which would be awesome. Vermont State Police has an embedded social worker. They might be filling Every the barracks. Claire Martin is a hire for the Royalty One and Cody, so if you are they hired. So they hired their. There. Yes, they have somebody in Royalton. Time. They have Kelsey Nanovich, who's that's her name. fantastic. Kelsey. Yes. yes. So I'm curious. Does that over? Does that match with the intentions of people at the school? They didn't want to have police coming in to do intervention, but could the social worker? Has anybody explored that? Not well, the school has social workers that do interventions. So this, I think, is line of communication between the school and, and Scott. I think this would be going out into the community and, and um, meeting people who are in potentially in crisis. Uh, anybody else have resources that they identified either that you know are available or that you wish your community had available for you if you were in this situation? Yeah, just along the lines of what we were talking about, just some kind of process to refer people that you know are in trouble that, but are homeless and, you know, are not taking care of themselves uh, and, you know, some kind of process to reach out to, to refer them and reach out to them and, and um, uh, intervene. Mm. So a process to refer people who are experiencing um, homelessness issues or other For issues. Maybe mental health issues, addiction issues that are, aren't asking for help, aren't, aren't uh, don't want to go, you know, or in a state of mind where they don't want anything to do with mm -hmm. help. Uh, so we can definitely talk about it. I'm not sure how successful we will be getting through that because, again, I think a lot of this relies on people being willing to engage. I don't know if Clara Martin Center has, do they, they have to reach out to you in order to get assistance? Yeah, I think it's voluntary service that we have to be willing to engage in services, but we take a lot of calls from family members, community partners who we have someone that they want us to reach out to or they might bring someone in with them and try and engage them that way, but it is a voluntary service, you know, to access mental health services to care. Um, but we'll try and do, and I think that's why we're trying to look at what we can do more in the community, work with some of our community partners as well, um, look at having people like Comsite. I know we've just started having some of our peers uh, visit the food shelf from the last thing that I heard. Um, so just make sure that we have different access points for people based on where they're comfortable showing up. I do think if you are, if you make yourself educated about the resources in the community and can talk to these people that you have connections with that need help, um, you could offer to go with them or offer to hold their hand while they're making that phone call and, and be a support for them. Um, but it is, it, it's more likely to get traction if you are helping them connect to the resource. Resources probably aren't going to be able to reach out. Since you opened it up to our wish list. Yes, wish list. <laughs> okay. um, I would love to have a homeless shelter or a homeless permit or a homeless units. I would love to have um, a drop-in place for the daytime, as you guys talked about, but I'd also like to have a drop-in place for folks with addiction issues, mm. which is a huge issue because if you're trying to move into home full, um, <laughs> having a home, <laughs> um, you really need to work on your addiction issues at the same time and we have no, um, we have no drop-in support services. In is that still the wrong home? It is still, we're at year nine. Nine. Year nine. We're good. We're good. <laughs> I've learned to pace expectations in my 20 years in the health and human services. <laughs> um, pacing expectations is super important. Uh, yes. Uh, we could work on like, a soup kitchen kind of thing because mm. a big Community thing that I'm seeing in the gaps is like they're not capable of maintaining refrigerated food or even heating up food, mm. even if it's canned. Oh, I'll add to that. In Montpelier, they really have a system where this church has Monday, this one has Tuesday, this, yeah. and so that there is a place for every day, and no one particular group has overly well overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, any other resources? Um, they actually, they actually do that. And uh, listen, 
mm -hmm. White River, right over right across the bridge into West Lebanon. Mm -hmm. They have community lunches and community dinners over there. Yeah. And that would be really awesome if we had something like that around here because I'd probably go every single day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, other resources that folks identified in their exercise that they would like to um, have available to them if they ended up in the situation or that they know of in their life that we haven't talked about. Money for car repairs. Money for car repairs. That is absolutely one that comes up, especially if you're living in your car and your car is your house. Yeah. Gas, cards. Gas cards. Yep. If you you have to be on reach up, I think, to qualify for that. So it's it's a very finite group of folks that qualify. The one thing with the, the gas vouchers is you can only get them every six months and they only give you $20 yeah. for, yeah. for six months. <laughs> um, I, got, I had a gas voucher and then I went to go apply for another one and they told me I had to wait six months in order to get one. Um, because I'll go down to the listen center and like if I need clothes, mm -hmm. my clothes are getting torn up and I need some, some shirts or yeah. something, um, they do those vouchers every three months. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to do the gas vouchers when they do them every six months and they only give you twenty dollars. Yeah, and that's again, that's a lack of resources issue. Which if we ha hey want to donate to gas cards, <laughs> you know, the Gifford Thrift Shop mm -hmm. is available to all homeless if they just let them know that okay. they're homeless and they don't pay. You won't pay for your clothes. Oh. I do, I do have vouchers to go yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. okay. yeah. But this is even better. It's free. Well, right. So we've talked to them in the past, and what it came down to was, yes, sometimes they were available, but it really depended in where, in, on where they were in their curriculum. So if they were working on a certain type of repair, they could get cars in at that point. Um, so it, it's hit or miss. Okay. Yes. I was just, there's something going on in Bronx, or maybe local, the, um, like a mobile care for, like mobile vet, oh. care for animals that are in need of, I think Upper Valley Haven has had some success working with um, some veterinary care clinics. Yeah, we have quarterly, uh, uh, clinic uh, from a, a donated by Little River uh, uh, and uh, do basic checkups and vaccinations. Uh, uh, we do it quarterly, and, uh, but and you should be working with somebody so that way you know when it's coming up because right. it, it will get filled up pretty quickly. Yeah. Again, BTC would be one to ask on that because they have a vet program. And we have a number of vets in the area, so maybe we could get somebody to do some pro bono hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's something we might be able to address. Yes. I'm sorry. What was that? Veggie Van Gogh. Oh, Veggie Van Gogh. Yes. Van Gogh once a month. Um, it's a great way to get produce. No questions. Just show up, and you can pick up for up to five families. So that can be sometimes five bags of apples, five bags of carrots. So it can be a lot. Um, and then with the vet thing, there's an organization called the Mitzvah Fund that has the mobile truck. I've seen it in Montpelier and travels around and does the vet care. Okay. Did you hear what that was? The vet care. Yeah. yeah the mobile clinic. Yeah. Um, so if you folks didn't hear, um, she was saying that the Veggie Van Gogh is monthly at Gifford. I think it's a, is it the second Thursday of the month at 11? 11.30 to 12.30, and you can pick up for five families at a time. Okay, yes, again. Um, housing for folks with uh, criminal histories. Yeah, I agree. Yes. I agree. That, that's a resource we wish, <laughs> wish we had. That's our wish list. And the gap. Wish list. Oh. Okay, did we have, yes. Um, but you made this is naive. Is there any way to like, partner folks with available housing, the RV in my yard, an elderly person in the household of 
you know, empty bedrooms, BTC with all the dorms empty, snowbirds in the winter, like to build trust relationships between those in need of housing and those with housing. So I think we definitely need to get creative in our thinking. So home share is one opportunity in terms of um, connecting people to a roommate situation. We've found a lot of times that folks we've worked with have sort of got a, gotten burned on roommate situations, so they're a little leery of going back into that. Um, but home share is a great resource. It does have background checks and it has um, uh, resources to help people mediate those um, situations that might come up and help them set up roommate agreements. So definitely for the right people, that is a great resource. In terms of are there people with land that would say, hey, you could have an RV here. Um, we would love to see that. That is really up to the individual homeowner. The reason being there are liability issues. So you would really want to talk to your insurance company um, before you did something like that. Um, now, if it's a family member or friend and you feel comfortable, great. Um, that's another thing to consider. If you have a family or family or friend who might be experiencing homelessness, do you have a basement or a couch or a room that they could stay in? Um, that would be another way that you could impact the situation. Are there zoning regs in regards to some of the, that? I know in some places there are. I don't know about... In terms of the camper, sometimes there are. It can be there for a certain amount of time before it's considered a... Uh, well, no, it's, it's not even tenancy. I think it's a uh, dwelling that they'll tax, I think is what we ha that saw come up. Do we know what they say here in Randall? No, that's what, that was the last I'd heard, was that if it was there if for a certain amount of time that somebody was living, it would be considered a dwelling that they would tax. But that was a few years ago when we looked at that. So if people are considering that, I would definitely suggest talking to your town, talking to your insurance provider. Kim? Yeah. Um Another resource, uh, local churches often have funds available for community need. Um, not a lot, but... The small basic needs that you might have. Yeah. Some of the local churches. <laughs> a lot of site boards are willing to overlook the camper issues and so on, even though they may go against their, mm. their regulations. So if they're approached on that, they often uh, overlook that. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a lack of communication because I think probably a lot of people that need the resources have no idea that some of these things are available. Mm -hmm. I think probably people like churches and so on that would be willing to give towards those things may not know yeah. the, uh, the amount of need there is yeah. right now. And um, but the overwhelming, they probably you know most people want to pull a pillow over the head and go back to sleep. Right. It just seems overwhelming the, the need. I, I was talking to South Royalton. Uh, the food shelf there, which I think is only open on Thursday, they'll get 100 people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and on Thursday evening or so. I mean, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, I think the housing crisis in general is overwhelming, and I think that's where we get stuck. Because there's so much needs to be done, and and focusing on just one part of it isn't going to actually resolve the issue. We have to figure out, you know, Martha, you were talking about if we had taken the money instead of going to the hotels and we put it somewhere else, what would it look like? Well. Okay, we might have been able to put that money toward permanent housing, but then what did you do with the thousands, two, three thousand homeless people in the state for four years over the winter? What did we do with them? So we have to be able to figure out how we. What if the closed up rest area had become a station that they already had the the yeah. And I think what happens is these things happen in a crisis. So they happen in a moment where you have to do things expediently. And unfortunately, that's not always the most cost-effective way that we do things. Um, but, but I think what I'm trying to get at is that we can't just approach building affordable housing. We have to determine what do we do for the folks that are living under the bridge, that are living in their car right now to keep them safe while we build that longer-term shelter or that longer-term housing option. Um, was there one last question, Lisa? Mm -hmm. It used to be that a human actually answered, but, um, <laughs> but um, that is a resource for people. And they also have a website where you can search mm -hmm. for legal assistance or whatever mm -hmm. if you get access to it. Yeah. And you can text them now. Yeah. Um, all right. So we are now at time, but I want to, if you, can you give me five more minutes? Mm -hmm. I want to talk about what's next. So there are a 
a lot of gaps and a lot of resource potential here. Are there one or two projects on here that you think we could actually move forward to create additional resources in our community to help folks right now or in a little while um, that you might be behind supporting either through volunteer work, through financial support, um, through helping brainstorm what that looks like? What do you think? Is there anything on here that we could turn into a reality? What if we took the um, ice skating rink area and um, made it into some kind of a facility that had this emergency setup for the, the um, you know, be able to have cooking facilities and be able to have the bathroom showers? So a drop-in center? Yep, I mean, they already have the showers. Mm -hmm. So I think drop-in center could be a good long-term, I don't know if that's the right place for it, but I think that that could be potentially something that we could do as a community long-term. I think Clara Martin Center's already got some ideas if we figured out as a community how to fund that. Um, what if folks, did you have something? Uh, I just wanna say that the ice rink is in use all winter long as an ice rink, and then during the summer months, it is a camp. Okay, all right, yeah. um, But that's not to say that that idea, and it has to be thrown out the door entirely, is in terms of uh, drop-in center. What do folks think about the idea of a longer-term solution to drop-in center? Is it something you think we need in the community? Yes. Something yes. you would support us exploring? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. <laughs> She's our hype person. Sorry. Um, okay, so let's go into the next page but for next steps. Within walking distance Yes, it would have to be very local. Okay, so drop-in center is a longer term solution. Okay. Yeah, well, it, hey, we explored the idea at one point, right? Um, and they had a, they had a commercial kitchen. Um, oh, uh, drop-in center. What about short term? I definitely think that the community dinner idea really has a lot of merit and putting, we could even figure out maybe a way to put it in like the Herald so that it's accessible to those who aren't able to maybe have access to a device to read on like updates that might be on like say the town website or um, with Capstone or all of that. Um, and then making sure opportunities like Again, I keep on talking about the education thing, no, but it's um, but it's uh, like um, making sure people are aware that there are educational opportunities for our younger folks, and uh, maybe some licensure like LNA stuff that might um, help prevent it. Getting better paying employment that could help you pay that rent. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, resource outreach uh, and, in parentheses, educational opportunities, and then um, uh, soup kitchen, community meal. I was thinking the community dinners that used to happen last month or mm -hmm. whatever, also having people that were like, available at those events to offer resources and services mm -hmm. so that if people are looking, they have mm -hmm. access right yeah. there. Um, yeah, I think we could certainly look at, I don't know that the model we used previously, it hasn't been successful since COVID. Um, and it's a very different audience um, than what we're looking at here. But I think there's definitely some value in trying to, I think, you know, like Martha said, the Montpelier Berry area, yeah. one church a day takes a, a breakfast slot or, and they're trying to expand to lunch and even open some cooling shelter options. And they have talked to different community providers about being there and being present during those hours. So. Um, that might be our step into the um, day shelter or drop-in shelter idea. Um, our Lady of the Angels Church has a free meal for the community once a month, mm -hmm. and it's scheduled for this coming Thursday. Great. I think the problem for some people is access to getting up to Our Lady of the Angels. So um, people can give people rides. It starts at 530. I think some of it also comes down to critical mass. And it may be that maybe we don't do same, things the same way Montpelier and Barry does. Maybe what we do is we have um, pre-made food that's available that can be heated up. So you know, if you have 50, 60 people coming on a regular basis, you know how to plan for that. But if you have one or two people coming here or there, 
we still want to provide for those one or two or three people, but it's on a different scale and a different model. So I think that's definitely something we could explore. Robin? Um, did I hear the food shelf does not allow food in the home? No, we allow prepared food. Yeah. They don't want to. Just not like home processed food from people. But if it's prepared in a commercial kitchen, it's fine. Yeah. So, yeah. So, after Thursday, if you sent me those leftover, pack them up, and there's some place where. Well, yeah, I think the issue is that has to be in a commercial kitchen by people who probably have like, like, serve safe license and stuff. Almost everyone that comes in and talks to me says that uh, their grocery bill is obviously growing. We all know mm -hmm. that. Um, we could take it from the short term with community meals to doing like maybe even in a drop-in center some kind of food security lessons, how to meal prep, how to meal plan, how to grocery shop, how to can and preserve food. Okay. We are... Two minutes past time. Well, seven minutes past the original time. So I think we've got a couple of items here that we could start with. Um, if we put, I don't want to lose track of all of you. <laughs> I want to keep in touch with you. So um, if we pass around a paper, do you want to give me your email address and I can put you in a list and send out information about what's going on and opportunities to get involved? Yeah. All right, let's get that around. All right. Thank you so much for coming out this well, evening. Sheet of paper so we don't all have to wait in long lines. <laughs> all right. We will pull these things together. We will send an invite out, and we hope to see a lot of you at our next meeting to talk about where we might move some of these things forward. Thank you.